Revelation chapter 14. Man, I can't believe how quickly the time has gone. Seems like we just started this study. So Lord, we want to thank you for the witness that you leave upon this earth. You never leave us without warnings, without messages, and without a witness. So tonight, Lord, uh, speak to our souls. Holy Spirit, teach us. We open our hearts to you. And we thank you that your word never returns empty. So as we study your word, Lord, bless us tonight. Thank you for all who are here and all who will be listening on YouTube later. I pray a blessing over your word in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Okay, we're going to be able to finish Revelation chapter 14, Lord willing, tonight. I want to do the uh, verses 6 through 12 to start with, and let's see where we go from there. Revelation 14, verses 6 through 12. And if, uh, if you're wondering, I, I'm using the New King James Version uh, for, gosh, 40 years. I shared out of the King James, but I changed a lot of the words to the modern meaning meeting and then finally I just switched to New King James because they did that for me. So uh, we're going to start uh, and there's Bibles in front of each pew that are in uh, New King James Version. So let's start in verse 6. This is the proclamation of the three angels that God sends. John says, then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. I like that verse because what it teaches us is that God doesn't change. It's the everlasting gospel. It doesn't change. I know sometimes our culture says, well, you know, that's old-fashioned, so we need to turn that up a little bit and fix it up. And No, no. It's the same gospel that it started to be the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Verse 7, he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. And then another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image, and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself will also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. So here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So in verse 6 through 12, it describes messages from three special angels that God has chosen. And uh, in the book of Revelation, when we first started in chapter 2 and 3, uh, remember God said, tell the church of Ephesus, uh, the angel of the church of Ephesus, the angel of the church of Sardis. Angel can often be a uh, switch for the word messenger. God uses angels as messengers. In this case, I believe God was speaking to those who were in authority in the church, the messengers to the church. So um, the first message is the first angel is preaching the gospel to sinners. Up to this point, God has only used men to reach other men. Now what I'm talking about men is mankind. Uh, because we know there were plenty of women that followed Jesus and they also shared the word of God with people. So this is the first time in human history that God chose to use an angel to bring the good news. So let's take a look at the book of Acts, chapter 1, and verse 8, where that message was clearly given to the apostles. Uh, 
and to those who were in the presence of the Lord before he rose into the clouds. He said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So when we bring that to us, what we're saying is we will receive power to be witnesses where we live, at home, that's our Jerusalem, then in Judea, which could be our city or even our state, and then Samaria, places that we are not familiar with, other states maybe, and then finally to the ends of the earth could be foreign countries. But God always starts us off where we live. Amen? He starts us off at home and moves us out. There's a lot of people that want to go to some foreign country and be, be a witness. In fact, I, uh, I know a Christian man who uh, didn't bother attending church and didn't really want to grow close to the Lord. And so I asked him, why? You know, you've accepted Christ as your Savior. He said, because I'm afraid that if I do, God will call me to go to Africa. <laughs> I said, well, well, let me ask you a question. Have you gone across the street to witness to the drug people across the street that are dealing drugs? No. Why would God send you to Africa when you won't even go across the street? <laughs> Amen? So the Lord's always concerned with us where we live. And then once we get that testimony established, then it's other places that we're not familiar with. Amen. I can't tell you how many times I've wanted to leave Santa Maria. I've been here 52 years. I was born and raised in Utah. Uh, at 17, I joined the Navy and came to California, and I've been here ever since. So literally, uh, from the time I got out of the Navy, I moved here to Santa Maria. I've tried several times to leave, but where God plants you, that's where you need to be. This is home for me. This is where God wants me to have my ministry. And then if he moves me some other place later, that's between him and the Holy Spirit. But meanwhile, let's be faithful where God's called us. Okay, so the second message was the second angel announces the imminent destruction of the political and economic Babylon. Now, this place is not the Babylon we think of in Scripture. It's a spiritual Babylon. So it's described in Scripture as having three shores. And uh, we need to read about it in Revelation chapter 18. The only conclusion I can draw from reading this chapter is we are the only country that fits the geographical description of spiritual Babylon. Uh, we have three shores. We have the right coast, the left coast, where we live, and then the bottom coast. So there's no other country that has three coasts that has reached out to the whole world with their goods. So let's read about it, and you can make your own decision. Chapter 18, verse 1 says, After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. He cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great has fallen, is fallen, and it has become the dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So I want to stop right there. This country was founded on godly principles. This country was founded with Bible in hand and with God in view. Amen? So spiritual fornication is when you leave your first love. So our first love in America was to worship God in spirit and in truth. And it doesn't take anyone with 2020 vision to see that we've departed from that vision as a nation. Now, not us as believers in Christ, of course, but as a nation, as a whole in a nation, it's becoming a place where the Bible is not welcome, prayer is not welcome, Christians are not welcome, 
uh, it has gotten absolutely like a cage for every foul bird and every unclean spirit. Now, I know and believe that God can turn this around. He absolutely can. He turned around uh, Nineveh. We talked about that last week with Jonah. Refused to go there because it was such a great, wicked city. But God turned the heart of the king and the heart of all the people in that land, and they repented. And that's my prayer for this year for America. Lord, help us as a nation to repent. But if not, this is prophecy in Scripture. And you know as well as I do that Jesus said, not one jot, not one comma will pass until everything is fulfilled. So I guess the good thing about Revelation 18 is it's after Revelation chapter 7, which proves that God uh, w made 144,000 witnesses sealed with the seal of God on their forehead, and then he caught the church up, and you can see that very plainly all over the Bible. It's in Daniel it's in Zephaniah, it's in Zechariah, it's in Isaiah, it's in Jeremiah, it's in Matthew, Mark, Luke, it's all over the Bible where God rescues his people. So it appears to me that after we're gone and the Antichrist comes into power that this spiritual Babylon is destroyed. It's interesting, back in the 1970s, evangelist Jack Van Impe uh, said over and over and over again, I've studied the Bible for years, cannot find America in modern day prophecy. Can't find it. So we love Jesus and our allegiances to him. Of course, we love our country, but our allegiance is to Christ first. So we take a look at this message and it says all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. It's talking about spiritual fornication, leaving your first love. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. There is no nation on this earth that lives luxuriously like we do. I have missionary friends in North India, I had a really good uh, friend, he's in heaven now, Eridard Mukasa, he was from Africa. When they came here and saw the way we live, they said, it is unbelievable you people are the richest people on earth. And you can look into every culture, no one lives deliciously like we do. No one. So he goes on to say, I heard another voice from heaven, verse 4, saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, lest you receive of her plagues. For her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Render to her just as she rendered to you, and repay her double according to her works, and the cup which she has mixed Mix it double for her. And the measure that she glorified herself and lived luxuriously, in the same measure give her torment and sorrow. For she says in her heart, I sit as a queen, I am no widow, and will not see any sorrow. And if you think about prior to the Twin Towers, no nation has ever invaded our nation. And you think about all the other nations on earth have been invaded. France was invaded. Poland was invaded. Germany was invaded after the war. On and on it goes. Russia was invaded by the Nazis. All over the world, Africa was invaded by the Nazis. And then most of uh, Western Europe was invaded. So all the different countries in the world have been invaded. You might say, well, China wasn't invaded. Yeah, if you know your history, they were. In the 1940s, the Japanese attacked and, uh, and brutally took out so many people in China. And so every nation has been attacked and war has happened there, but not here. Not here. So therefore, the Bible says in verse 8, her plagues will come in one day. Death, mourning, and famine she will utterly be burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. And the only modern day 
uh, device that I can think of that would burn a whole nation in fire is a nuclear weapon. That is the only thing I can think of. So the scripture goes on to say in verse 9, Now the kings of the earth who committed fornication and lived luxuriously with her will weep and lament for her when they see the smoke of her burning, standing at a distance for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city. And oftentimes in scripture when it talks about a great city, it's talking about a country. Okay, so alas, alas, that great city, Babylon, that mighty city, in one hour, your judgment has come. And the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her, and no one will be able to buy their merchandise anymore. Merchandise of gold and silver, and precious stones and pearls, fine linen and pure uh, purple and silk and scarlet, every kind of citron wood, every kind of object of ivory, every kind of object of most precious wood, bronze, iron and marble, and cinnamon and incense, fragrant oil and frankincense, wine and oil, fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and chariots, and bodies and souls of men. Now we take a look at that and we think, well, wait a minute, souls of men, what's that about? How many wars have we been involved with all over the earth? Not to mention the 73 million documented abortions in America. That's the souls of men. The fruit of your soul longed for has gone from you, and all the things which are rich and splendid have gone from you, and you will find them no more at all. The merchants of these things who become rich by her will stand at a distance for fear of her torment, weeping and wailing, and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. In one hour such great riches have come to nothing. Every shipmaster, all who travel by ship, and sailors, and as many as trade by the sea, stand at a distance. And they cry out when they see the smoke of her burning, saying, What is like this great city? So really the question here is, What other country is like this country? What other country? They threw dust on their heads and cried out, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city in which all who had ships on the sea became rich by her wealth, for in one hour she is made desolate. So rejoice over her, O heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, This way, with violence, the great city Babylon will be thrown down and shall not be found any more. You know, that's a terrifying statement because not only Dr. Jack Van Impey, but others have said all throughout uh, studying Bible prophecy, we can't find any nation that matches like America in the final end prophecies. The sound of harpists and musicians and flutists and trumpeters will not be heard in you anymore. There'll be no craftsman of any craft will be found in you anymore. And the sound of a millstone shall not be heard in you anymore. And the light of a lamp shall not shine in you any more. And the voice of the bridegroom and bride shall not be heard in you any more. Because your merchants were the great men of the earth. For by your sorcery all nations were deceived. Now that word is interesting, sorcery. It's the Greek word pharmakia. It means drugs. We are numero uno in the world as far as consumers of drugs both prescription drugs and illegal drugs and other countries are getting rich off of our nation because they transport drugs here and make billions of dollars were you aware that in California we have over 10,000 illegal marijuana farms that are run by the cartels and they're allowing it to happen. They're making billions of dollars every year. Somebody is getting paid under the table. 
We could easily stop that with the National Guard or even our military, but it hasn't stopped. It's growing. I looked up the numbers. 7,500 illegal farms in Lassen and Shasta County, 1,500 of them in San Bernardino County, and over 500 and counting in L.A. County, not to mention all the other counties in our state. Unbelievable. And so the scripture says, by your sorcery, pharmakia, all the nations were deceived. And in her was found the blood of prophets and saints and all who were slain upon the earth. All I have to say positive about that whole chapter, we won't be here. If you trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the scripture plainly teaches in Revelation chapter 7 that all of a sudden on God's heaven, heaven's throne room floor, millions of believers show up in bodies which God talked about in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15 we showed up with a new body a glorified body on heaven's throne room floor praising God waving palms and dressed in white robes so we will not be here for this event but this event will happen just like the way God said it would heaven and earth shall pass away Jesus said but my word shall never pass away so the third message, after the destruction of Babylon and after the gospel, the everlasting gospel preached to sinners by the first angel, the third angel preaches the last hellfire and brimstone message that will ever be preached to the unsaved. I wonder seriously how many pulpits, not just in the world but in our country, have actually shared the teaching of where people go when they refuse to receive Christ and his gift of eternal life. I know back in the 50s and 60s there was plenty of preaching but all of a sudden this new wave of believing came along and well we don't want to hear hellfire and brimstone anymore. Well that's like saying I know the road's out up ahead but keep driving 80 miles an hour. It's okay. You know, uh, just have fun, go fast, and then nobody talks about the cliff that's on the way. And I think if we truly walk in love, we're going to warn people where not to go and show them, shine the light of where they would like to go to have eternal life. This third angel preaches the last hellfire and brimstone message that will ever be preached to the unsaved. It becomes obvious that no one responds to the message. How tragic that Christ once drank this same cup for us unrepentant sinners, but now these are forced to drink it themselves. So let's go to, we read in Revelation chapter 14 up to verse 12. Let's begin again and go to the end of the chapter. In verse 13, Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, so that they may rest from their labors and their works will follow them. Then I looked and behold a white cloud and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. Another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud. Thrust in your sickle and reap for the time has come for you to reap the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth and the earth was reaped. Then another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven. He also had a sharp sickle. And then another angel came out from the altar who had power over fire. And he cried with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth for her grapes are fully ripe. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. 
and the winepress was trampled outside the city, and blood came out of the winepress up to horses' bridles for 1,600 furlongs. I want you to think about that. If you've ever been around any animals that were slaughtered, the blood usually goes into the ground. So this means that the blood had to soak the ground so much that it could no longer hold any blood. And then the blood began to rise to bridal high, which would be about right here. Bridal high, 1,600 furlongs long. Someone said that's the distance from here to Los Angeles. So if you can imagine, almost 200 miles long, a mile wide, and bridal high. Blood from those who were killed. Now, you say, how is that going to happen? Well, we'll study that later in Revelation chapter 19. But here's the way John describes it, starting with verse 11. John says, I saw heaven opened, and behold, there was a white horse, and he who sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he comes to judge and make war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written which no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed in a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And then the Bible says the armies which were in heaven followed him, clothed in fine linen, and they were sitting upon white horses. And then the Bible goes on to say that Jesus comes to tread out the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. So there's been some confusion about who is the real Jesus. Because the one that's been preached for many years is the one who never gets offended at anything. He accepts anything, everyone, and every idea. Uh, and that's not the real Jesus. That's a Jesus that has been made up by religious people. The real Jesus is love. The Bible says God is love. If you're a believer, if you're a Christian, God is love. He loves you with an everlasting love. But if you reject him, he is not the Jesus that says it's okay. He came and gave us a free gift of eternal life by dying on the cross. If we reject him, we can only face his wrath after that. We must be born again. So in verse 13, the message from the Holy Spirit is that it is better for believers to die at that time than what's going to happen on the earth. So let's take a look at Revelation 3, uh, verses 20 and 21. It gives you a better picture of what we're talking about here. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So in verses 14 through 20, it's really an announcement of Armageddon. It's an announcement of the great war between the God of heaven and the people who rebel on earth. I was one of those for 28 years. I didn't even believe there was a God. Uh, God reached me with his everlasting gospel, just like he reached every single one of you. He reached us with the truth, with the gospel. Like the Apostle Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God to save everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So there is one way, one truth, and one life. Jesus paid it all. And if we'll receive him and believe in him, the scripture says we'll be saved from his wrath. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 9 tells us that. God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. So in verses 14 through 20, he gives the announcement of Armageddon or the, the final war. So in Daniel chapter 7, if you'll turn there with me, the book of Daniel right after Ezekiel, Daniel the seventh chapter, verse 13 and 14. Daniel 
Bible says, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, there was one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. And he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. So Daniel sees this vision after we just read Revelation 18, or 19, 11 through uh, 18, about him coming with his wrath to tread out the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. What God does after that, he throws the prophet, uh, the false prophet and the beast into the, into the lake of fire. And then he establishes what we uh, refer to as the millennial kingdom, a 1,000 year reign with us reigning and ruling with Christ and with those who were saved on the earth that didn't get destroyed from God's wrath, those who believed, they'll also go into that millennial kingdom. They will have bodies like we have. They'll be able to procreate. And after a thousand years, the earth will be replenished with people again. But unfortunately, when after the devil has been put in the bottomless pit for a thousand years, he comes back up and deceives all the nations. And all those people who have seen Christ on the throne in Jerusalem, we've preached the gospel to them, we've shared with them, all of those people will rise up and try to fight against the Lord. And the Bible says the end of all of that is fire will come down from heaven and consume them all. And then the earth and its works will be burned up and all the elements will melt with heat, including heaven. And that's why in Revelation 21, we get a new heaven and a new earth because the first heaven and the first earth were burned up. They were passed away. So in uh, the book of Joel, so if you go back to Daniel, and then after Daniel is Hosea and then Joel. So the book of Joel, a couple of books over from Daniel to the right. Joel chapter 3 verses 9 through 17. Another prophecy and proclamation of what's going to happen. Proclaim this among the nations, Joel says. Prepare for war. Wake up the mighty man. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Assemble and come all you nations and gather together all around. Cause your mighty ones to go down there, O Lord. Let the nations be awakened and come to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come and go down, for the winepress is full. The vats overflow, their wickedness is great. Multitudes and multitudes are in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon will grow dark, and the stars will diminish their brightness. And the Lord also will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and earth will shake, but the Lord will be a shelter for his people and the, shel and the strength of the children of Israel. And so you shall know that I am the Lord your God dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then Jerusalem shall be holy, and no alien shall ever pass through her again. It's an amazing prophecy in the book of Joel. So in chapter 14, this chapter that we're studying tonight gives us a picture of the multitudes and multitudes in the Valley of Decision. I don't know about you, but I have talked to people who said, you know, I hear what you're saying. Uh, I, I need to wait and make a decision later. The Bible says, don't boast yourself about tomorrow, Proverbs 27.1. For a man does not know what a day will bring forth. In the book of James chapter 4, the Bible says, what is your life? It is even like a vapor that appears for a little while and vanishes away. So I want to tell you a story. Some of you have heard it. Some of you have not. 
So I had been saved probably a couple of years in 1982. And so in 1982, I was sitting on my front porch, just kind of, you know, sitting out in the cool air. And I saw this truck coming down my street, and right when it got in front of my house, it just died. And I heard a bunch of cra uh, noise uh, from the transmission. It sounded like the tranny blew in the truck. So I watched this young guy start pushing this truck to the curb, but it was difficult for him to do so. So... I felt like the Lord said, you're a wonderful Christian sitting there and watching this guy work all by himself. <laughs> so, so I got up off my chair and went out in the street and helped him push the truck to the curb. When I did so, I threw out my left knee. I had heard it uh, playing a game of football. I hurt my right one uh, kicking an old panhead Harley over. But on my left one, I was playing football, and this big heavy guy tackled me and bent my leg backwards. <laughs> so I threw out that knee. So he helped me after we got the truck to the curb. He helped me limp back to the house. And then he said, what happened to your leg? And I told him my testimony, how I used to ride with a bunch of unsavory characters. And uh, I told him the story, and he said, you're not the guy that had all those motorcycles here all the time on the front yard, and everybody was, you know, banqueting and rioting and doing all that. And I said, I'm the guy. And he said, well, what happened to you? Perfect open door. And I shared with him how I got saved. It took me about 30 minutes to share my story of how I received Christ as my Savior. His name was John Davis. He was probably 21, maybe 22 years old. He had just gotten out of the Marine Corps. And so uh, we had the service in common, etc. We got to talking, and I just said, Hey, John, I'm just curious. What about you? Have you accepted Christ as your Savior? And he said, You know, I'm, I don't make snap decisions. Uh, I'd have to think about that. And I had a gospel tract, and so I gave him this gospel tract that said, if you died today, do you know you'd go to heaven? And it had all the scriptures in the book of Romans to teach the simplicity of the gospel and a sample prayer on the back. So I, he put it in his, uh, his pocket of his Levi jacket, and he started to go out the door, and I felt the Holy Spirit telling me, don't let him go. Don't let him go. Ask him to come back in. So I did. And I literally begged him to accept Jesus as his Lord and Savior. And he said again, you know, I'm not being disrespectful. I just don't make quick decisions. I, I need some time to think about this. So I said, well, here's another gospel tract. It's a different one. It was called Four Spiritual Laws. I gave him one of those and he put it in this pocket. That's the last time I saw John alive. A couple of days later, I got a call from an elderly gentleman. I'd never met him, but he just lived two, two streets over on Hermosa Street. I lived on Tunnel Street at the time. He called and he said, uh, is this Greg? And I said, yes. And he said, uh, I need to know why these were in my son's pockets. And I said, what, what is that? And he said, well, there's one that says, if you died today, do you know to go to heaven? And the other one is four spiritual laws. And immediately it came back to me. Oh man, what happened? And he said, today we went to the morgue to identify our son. He was going around that last corner in Avila Beach and somebody cut it wide. And he cut it wide and they had a head-on collision and he died on, on the scene. I don't know if John accepted Christ. I know I begged him to. The Bible says don't boast yourself about tomorrow. You don't know what a day will bring forth. So I went over to Dawn and Penny's house and I had the privilege of leading Dawn, Penny, their daughter Patty, and their son Chuck to Christ. And uh, for the next 20 years or so, uh, Dawn and Penny and I were very close in Christian fellowship. They attended the same church I did. I ended up years later doing Don's funeral, Penny's funeral, Chuck's funeral, and the first funeral I did was their son John. 
So I've done the funerals for the entire family except for Patricia. She's still alive. She lives up in Visalia. But I wanted to share that with you because of what I read here. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. That's not a good place to be. Uh, all over the scripture, uh, especially Elijah the prophet, when he stood before the wicked prophets of Baal, he said, how long will you halt between two opinions? If Baal, or if the devil is God, then worship him. If God is God, then worship him. And people are having a hard time making a decision about a free gift, which is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And I mean, it would be something if we had to jump through hoops and go through broken glass and everything else. But, you know, the only thing you can do with a free gift is receive it. Uh, you may not even deserve it. In fact, I know we don't. But you can't pay for it. It's already paid for. So the, the only thing we can do is receive the free gift of eternal life. And I pray and hope and pray that John did. So the question is, what will it take for some people to make a decision for the Lord? God has gone to every length in this chapter to give mankind an opportunity to repent. Think about it. First angel going through and preaching the everlasting gospel to all the nations. The second one brings the message of the destruction of the richest country in the world. The third one brings the message of eternal judgment if they don't receive Christ. And what do they do? You read Revelation 15, 16, 17, you'll find this saying uh, in those scriptures, and they repented not of their deeds, and they blasphemed the God of heaven. Over and over and over. I was uh, listening to some near-death experiences. There's this pastor named John Burke, who had a big church, I think it was in Texas, and he's had to give the church over to his assistant, and he's going all around the country now sharing 30 years of investigation of people who have had near-death experiences. And one of them just shocked me to the ground. I mean, not all of them were, I saw heaven's gates. You know, I saw the beauty. I, I saw the glory of God. Not, not everyone was like that. He spoke of one where a person actually smelled the fires of hell and the sulfur and heard the cries of anguish and then God allowed him to come back and make a decision. And when John Burke interviewed him, he said, you know, I understand, and, uh, but I, I choose to go there anyway. And it's like, how hard does your heart have to be to see a smoking furnace with people screaming and yelling and saying, I want to go there instead. That's a hardened heart and a reprobate mind. So in Jude verse 22 and 23, I qualify under 23. Many of you qualify under 22. Verse 22 says, on some you should have compassion. That will make a difference. Others, you must pull them out of the fire, hating even their clothing spotted by the flesh. And so the scripture says there's both ways to preach the gospel. Jesus loves you, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. John 3.36 puts it this way, He that believes in me has everlasting life. He that does not believe will not see life, but the wrath of God will abide on him. That is the double-edged sword of the gospel. You can't have one without the other. Why? Because God put it this way in Scripture in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. It's interesting that God puts shall not perish first. Amen? Because that's the reason he came. We were all lost in our sin. So he said, I don't want you to perish. I want you to have eternal life. But the, the hardness of men's hearts and their pride, 
will cast them down to the pit. So I just want to close tonight's study talking about the pride of man. We just finished the, the month of June. They called it Pride Month. People proud of going against God's commission of male and female. So now these people worship male and male, female with female, some with animals, etc. It's just debauchery. And it's not the only sin in the Bible, but I wanted you to think about it this way. How come we have one day for the people who fought and died for our country called Veterans Day, and now we have a whole month for homosexuality? What kind of reasoning is that? It, it is unbelievable. It's from the pit. And so it's caused by pride. I will not turn. I will not accept the gift of God. I will do it my own way. So let's talk about pride. Psalm chapter 10 and verse 4. So Psalm's right in the middle of your Bible. Psalm 10 and verse 4. Had to laugh. Someone made this comment to one of our parishioners. Oh, I don't know that I really want to go to that church. All he does is preach on hell. <laughs> well, to be truthful, I share the love of God, the wrath of God, the goodness of God, the blessings of God, and what it's going to cost if we reject God. Because that is the whole message. If my goal were to fill this building, I would do like a lot of people that I see on TV. It's all good. God just wants you to be rich. He just wants you to be happy. He just wants you, if you give me 500, God will give you 5,000, etc., etc. That's all garbage. That does not help people to know that they're lost and they need to be saved. So in Psalm 10 and verse 4, the scripture says, the wicked in his proud countenance will not seek God. God is in none of his thoughts. Now let me bring that home to you. Until I was 28 years old, I never thought about God. I mean, I went to the Greek Orthodox Church for the first 17 years of my life. And I couldn't wait to get out of there. I joined the Navy, moved to San Diego, might as well move to Sodom and Gomorrah. And from there, I just walked against God in rebellion for 10 years. And the only time I ever thought about God was when I got a job with Coca-Cola and my different accounts that I would go to, people would try to talk to me about Jesus. And man, I rejected it. It was like, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to talk. And finally, I ran into a Christian who knew both sides of the story. And he said, you know what? I won't talk to you anymore about Jesus. If you don't want to hear about Jesus, I've told you a thousand times he loves you. You don't want to hear about that. You need to hear about the place you're assigning yourself to go because of your pride. And he shared with me the doctrine of hell. And that woke me up. And I thank God because Jude verse 22 and 23 says, On some, have compassion. That will make a difference. But others, you must save them with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even their clothing uh, burdened by sin. So it's important for us to realize if they won't come by love, then the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Amen? And a lot of people sitting in here tonight have come by the love of God. You heard the gospel. You heard that Jesus died for you on the cross, that he was buried, that he rose from the dead. And you said, where do I sign up? How do I accept this free gift? But when you're full of pride and you want to do it your own way, that's not appealing at all. And that's what the Bible says. God is in none of his thoughts. Proverbs chapter 11 so right after Psalms, if you keep turning to your right, you get into Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 2 says, When pride comes, then comes shame. 
But with the humble is wisdom. So all God's asking for us to do is to humble ourselves. Proverbs 13 and verse 10. By pride comes nothing but strife. I was at a uh, ministry meeting Tuesday night, last night, and I asked how Brother Dan was doing. Dan preached here one time for the black sheep. And I said, how's he doing in his new church up in Washington? And they said, oh man, it's a constant battle. They're constantly fighting. Constantly the, the deacons fight with one another. They fight against the pastor. There's, you know, I am so blessed to pastor this church, to minister here. I praise God that our aim is preach the gospel, love the people. We can all agree on that. We may not agree on the kind of food we like or anything else, but we can agree on loving one another and hearing the truth of God. And so uh, this scripture came out of my mouth before I could shut my lips. <laughs> I said, do you know why they're fighting? And one of the brothers said, uh, yeah, because they're angry. And I said, no, nope, that's not it. The Bible says only by pride comes contention. So whenever there's an, this going on, it's because of pride. It's because of somebody won't yield. Somebody won't humble themselves. So Proverbs 13 and verse 10 says, By pride comes nothing but strife, but with a well-advised is wisdom. Proverbs 16 and verse 18 Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. I had someone tell me a while back, I'll do exactly what I want to do. And I wanted to say to him so bad, you know what? A haughty spirit comes before a fall. You can prepare for that. But the Lord wouldn't let me say it. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Proverbs 29 and verse 23. And I picked a lot out of Proverbs. The Lord showed me these. That Proverbs is a book of wisdom. So if we really want wisdom and know how to walk with God, Proverbs would be a great book to study. Proverbs 29 and verse 23. A man's pride will bring him low. Absolutely true. But the humble in spirit will retain honor. And then we want to go to the book of Jeremiah 49. So if you turn, keep turning to your right, you'll get past Isaiah into Jeremiah. And towards the end of Jeremiah, chapter 49 and verse 16. Your fierceness has deceived you. Just watched a clip of uh, Joe on TV saying, uh, I hear all these Second Amendment people saying they're going to fight against the government. Well, if you want to fight against us, you're going to need an F-15 plane. That sounds like a threat to me. And I thought, how dare you even claim to be the President of the United States and threaten your people with F-15 jets? How horrible is that? And so Jeremiah 49 and 16 says, Your fierceness has deceived you, and the pride of your heart, O you who dwell in the clefts of the rock, who hold the height of the hill, though you make your nest as high as an eagle, God says, I will bring you down from there, says the Lord. Jesus said it this way, He that exalts himself shall be abased. The word abased in the Greek means thrown down with force. But he that humbles himself shall be exalted. So God says you want to be proud? You want to build your nest up high? God's going to throw you down with force. But if we humble ourselves and submit to him, he will lift us up. That's what the scripture teaches. 
So I want to end with 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 through 17. That talks all about the ways of this world. Now, I know the scripture says, love not the world, in 1 John 2, 15. It's talking about the world system. Okay? Uh, people said, well, are we supposed to hate the earth? It's not talking about the earth. It's talking about the world system. Uh, Psalm 24, 1 says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, and all those who dwell therein. So the earth belongs to God. We shouldn't worship the earth, but we should take care of it. Okay? But we're talking about the world system. 1 John 2.15 says, Love not the world, or the world system. For all that is in the world, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, and the lust of the flesh, is not of the Father, it is of the world. And the world is passing away. But he that does the will of God will abide forever. So God says, man, if, if you love the world system, which the way I view it, he who dies with the most gold win, that's pretty much the goal. And I've always just said, no, he who dies with the most gold still dies. The point is, will you die in the Lord or will you die without the Lord? So... The world system is corrupt. Really, especially in our country, the goal is make more. That's the goal. Everything you see on TV, all this stuff that's thrown at us, is all about making more and bigger and better and getting more into your account. And Jesus said, don't lay up your treasures on earth where moth and rust corrupt and thieves break through and steal but rather lay up your treasures in heaven. And I believe that's exactly where we are now in 2024. Our attention is on heaven. And I understand we still live on the earth. I understand God has still called us to shine the light and let our works glorify our Father which is in heaven. I get all of that. But I think we need to be more heavenly minded now to give us hope as we travel through these perilous times. Amen? So, in conclusion, Revelation 14 is about the hardness of the heart. It's about God sending three angels with three different messages, and everybody just shuns the message. It is incredible what happens in chapter 15, and we'll get there next week. But I want to thank you for being here tonight, and we're going to go ahead and close in prayer. So, Father, uh, thank you for the time we've been able to spend in your word. And first of all, Lord, I want to thank you that it's your word, not my ideas, not anyone else's ideas, your holy word. You said heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. And so, Father, I thank you for giving us your word tonight. Holy Spirit, thank you for leading and guiding in this teaching. And I pray, Lord, even for those who will listen on YouTube later, that you will move mightily through the airwaves, through the TV screen, and that if there's anyone out there who listens and doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, they can simply say, Lord, I am a sinner, and I repent. I ask you to forgive me. And I open my heart and ask you, Lord God, to please apply the blood that you shed on the cross to pay for my sins. And I pray there'll be people that will be born again into the kingdom of God through this message. And I thank you, Father, for blessing each one who's attended here tonight. I pray for safety as they travel back to their homes. And I ask a blessing over them as they meditate on the things that we've heard tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Uh, it's straight up 8 o'clock. So you can write that in your miracle book. <laughs> All right. God bless you and you're dismissed. It's nice to have everybody here today. If you haven't met Brenda in the back, be sure and stop by and say hi to her. You were wounded for our transgression. You were
punishment that was due for our peace was laid on.